So, uh, please, uh, anybody that has a question, uh, uh, please put that in the in the in the chat. Or uh, I don't know about math. If everybody can, I don't think people can speak. No. Or uh, yeah. Um attendees can raise their hand and uh, we will give them permission to speak or they can type the questions. So. Okay. So I will give uh, one or two minutes uh, to anybody that has questions. It could be also the speakers, eh, to the other speakers. <laughs> so, so can I, uh, maybe I, I can ask a question. This is to uh, Pedro. Um, so yes. your embedded element uh, um, are, how do you handle um, the gapping between the pile mm -hmm. and the surrounding? Yeah. Good, good point. Right now, I am not. Uh, mm -hmm. With this embedded element, I am not including uh, gapping. And uh, for all the other uh, implementations of contact that we have done in open seas, we have looked at gapping. That creates a, a, a monster problem, in particular, when you are trying to model the contact in a dynamic system where you have the gap opening and closing and gapping and closing. So what we found that is, in general, gapping doesn't happen in a, a depth. They usually happen close to the surface, but not at a depth. And so that's why we have, a, in this for this one, I have not included. But I think that it's possible to add gapping to the, or co any contact formulation to this embedded element. I think it's possible. That's why I say that we need to continue doing some work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the embedded element uh, as it stands now is a, yeah pretty nice in terms of dealing with the meshing between the different uh, components. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, like uh, for the additional uh, difficulty, like a uh, gapping, uh, I don't see an uh, easy way. <laughs> Yeah. No, but you but you touch exactly on, on the important aspect, at least for me, mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, when to model one pile is not a problem. Mm -hmm. But when I try to model uh, 11 piles uh, and and I am working with an structural engineer, so they are they are not they don't care too much about the piles <laughs> and about the soil, <laughs> even though that they care about the effect of that, but they say. Hey, you are going to use almost 90% of the elements in your pile? No, no, you have to simplify that. Mm -hmm. But we, we, I try to bring that closer to some, uh, so that the modeling is more doable. And I, that's why I think embedded elements play, as you said, it simplifies things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, uh, can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, yes. talking about group of pile, so I Actually, in reality, we need to remove many soil elements for, for the space of the, the pipe, for group of pipe. So uh -huh. but in, in, in the embedded pipe element, we don't need to remove any soil element. So um, do you think that like in, in the group of pipe, when we need to remove many soil elements, does it like affect the result or? When you remove the, no, I don't think that it removes because you, then you are including the stiffness of the pile. So, so, uh, and actually, in our case, the, the soil elements stay inside. The part that is inside the, the embedded element, if you imagine, is still there, but it doesn't contribute much. The pile is much stronger than the, much stronger than the, uh, so I don't need to do anything, or we don't know. Oh, yeah, 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 so, yeah. Uh, part that is inside. Uh, so, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, Anybody? Pedro, it's Michael. I have a couple, Michael couple. Scott. Yeah, yeah. Michael's got a couple questions. Michael Scott. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, this is for uh, Dr. Nguyen from uh, Caltech. So the you, you talked about a the gyro mass uniac steel material, which is kind of like uh, basically an inerter, right? Like a, a acceleration dependent force. Right, and, and from what, there's a couple of inerter elements in open seas already, like as two node link and, and other, and I think some attempts at putting uh, inerter behavior into uniaxial materials, but I think it gets a little bit complicated to do it in a material as opposed to 
to and at the element level. So could could you maybe elaborate on how that gyro mass material works? Oh. Or I mean, I'm I'm not an expert in in inerters, but I, I know people that have implemented them, and it, it seems like doing it within the material gets a little bit complicated. Uh, so I don't know if you have any input on that or. Uh, so uh, basically. Basically, the gyro mass is very like similar to spring and dashboard. For example, for, for the spring in open seas, uh, you use a uh, linear material combined with the zero length. And also for the dashboard, uh, you input the, 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 the uh, you use the uh, viscous material with the uh, zero length element. And a similar thing for, for the gyro mass, um, you, uh, you, you use that type of material and combine with the zero length. So basically for the material in OpenSea, we need to input the, uh, the, the, the strain and the strain rate. So for, for, for the gyro mass material, uh, based on those two uh, like input, uh, we use the new mark, uh, new mark uh, for example, the average uh, acceleration scheme to calculate the, 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 the acceleration. That's and internal. So, You're doing Newmark internal to the material. Yeah, internal right? the material. Yep. Yeah. So so why not just use an element to to do it? Because um, yeah. then know. it's then it's done for you, right? At the the global level. I, I guess. I mean, that's kind of the rub with the uh, the inerter elements as materials is you have to do an internal time stepping, right? Um, uh, but I, 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 I we we can follow up later. But I had a second question. I, I don't want to okay. go. go yeah, I'll go too far uh, on that, but I, I guess for uh, Shijan and I guess it looks like Professor Elgamal is on too. The the R RPM two K D software or, or whatever it's is this. I guess maybe I missed something, but is this intended to supplement Open Seas, leverage Open Seas, do something different from Open Seas, or what? What's kind of the the end game? With this project, uh, with respect to open seas, because it looked to me like you're taking some models that El Professor Algermal and his team wrote 15, 20 years ago, and porting them into RPM 2KD. Or, or am I not? I know I'm saying that wrong, but um, and, and then so so kind of how does this play out in the long term, or, or how does this uh, this this project support open seas or, or build upon it or uh, I'm I'm sorry if it sounds a little bit uh, obscure uh, the question or unclear but but maybe I missed something so could you clarify kind of the the landscape of of, of where this is going um, right I mean you're right um, so currently we just connect some of the uh, soil constitutive model from open seas with uh, RKPM 2D uh, firmware. But uh, like I said, um, um, the, the RKPM 2D now um, is implemented in MATLAB. So uh, it is computation expensive. So we are thinking to convert the code to uh, maybe Fortran or, or, or C++. So we also uh, thinking about like connect the uh, RKPM 2D with OpenSeas. So, um, um, so we, we, we choose C++ based. So, um, um, so finally, we, uh, we, we can use all the library uh, from OpenSys uh, and, and uh, uh, conduct analysis in uh, uh, using the, um, the RKPM uh, computation framework. Okay, and I think Pedro, I think you had some questions too. Uh, you, you were about yeah, this presentation, I, 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 right? I, I, uh, <laughs> But that, I, 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 you were a little bit excited after after the uh, yeah yeah, yeah. After the I will I will not and it's and it's excellent yeah. work but oh yeah and um, but you know the problem with Zoom I see these hands like this so I need to let Boris ask because oh, there's been... a, I I can't see the other hands I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, yeah, Boris, Boris yeah I, and then yeah. and then I will be back yeah. I will be back okay. later Boris okay can you hear me yes yes oh, okay thank you because hold on I have a cell phone ringing at, the, at that moment I'm trying to talk. Uh, nice talks. I uh, I'm not sure where does the whole uh, frequency domain going. Why why are you guys doing frequency domain? But uh, Pedro, so so I think the actual gapping is important, you know, because it's actually going to change the effective length of the of the of the column. So you know, so you might need to 
And I don't think, I think that what you did before was to implement uh, gapping as a, or, you know, you talk about this contact problem. Uh, I actually don't call it contact like the contact means that you have two objects flying to each other and then you need to figure out where the contact is. We know where the, where the interface, we know where, the, where they're touching. So it's really a constitutive one, it's not really a geometric problem. So I think from that point of view, it can be implemented really, really easily. It's just a constitutive one. It's just zero stiffness when you have an open gap and, and some stiffness, it's yeah. not linear stiffness when you close the gap. No, I, I, I agree. I agree with you, uh, particularly close to the surface. Uh, yeah, the effective that, that, length that, that, has, has a yeah. huge effect on the on the response of the bridge band, for example. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and I and, and I just send you. I, I guess quick email. I, I like that. So if you have some papers, send them over. Uh, I send you check your email later on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I will look and and um, now contact careful because. Uh, Yes, gapping is one thing, but con you, you can have a point in contact, but then later it's a different point that is contact with this other, with the same soil point. So that's what for me is real contact, when the contacts change, yeah, but not yeah, when they yeah, open yeah, or when yeah. they close. Yeah, for me, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's a step in the middle. No, and, no, but, uh, but you have a pile in the soil or you have a foundation on the surface, it's not gonna fly over and, and you know, uh, you know, jump from here and then and make contact somewhere else. It's gonna be there. It's gonna slip a little bit, maybe open a little gap, and that's all. There's nothing. Yeah. I mean, if it starts moving too much, then you have different problems, and, and you're you're not talking about civil engineering anymore. Yeah. No, I I, I agree. I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. And yeah. and that's why I said that I we we need to continue doing. Right now is uh, just the perfect bonding, perfect bonding, and allowing some relative movement. Based on a very simple hostility relation. Okay. That, thank uh, is, so, um, but thank, thank you, thank you, Boris. Uh, any other question? So, so I have I have a, a couple. Uh, <laughs> um, one is um, for uh, for you, Jian. Uh, you were talking about the stability issues. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more what, what the problems you were finding? Um, so far, uh, we don't see the um, like all the sample problems that we solved. Uh, we actually did not see any unstable situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so they're all stable. But uh, uh, some of the cases, uh, the poles, because like FIR filter, it has poles and the poles are actually quite close to, um, to the unit circle surface. So once it exceeds, then, um, then it's gonna, not going to be stable. So the stability issue, we actually have two points. One is field, at the filter level, we want to make sure it's stable. Uh, second is when this filter is combined with the structure, uh, whether this is a filter or not, uh, right now we don't have a method to, to know beforehand uh, whether this is stable or not. So it's a still ongoing uh, process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and you have implemented that already in OpenSeas? No, not yet. Uh, we have done this uh, in my lab. Yeah, all of this uh, so far, the work is still all in my lab, yeah. And I agree. This has a. Could you apply this method also for a pile foundation? Could it be possible to a complete pile system? So yeah. So basically, if you uh, provide the frequency dependent uh, uh, impedance function, um, either it's through uh, like a three D finite element uh, um, model or through the like uh, even the experimental work. Uh, as long as you provide those impedance function, um, we can convert that into the time domain um, right now using the FIR or IIR. And this, so then that you uh, analyze the, um, in, like in time domain. Yeah, yes. so, but I, I, I believe if your superstructure and also whether your impeaching the form uh, might have some uh, impact onto like whether this method is good or not. So eventually I think we plan to offer some of the um, testing examples and to show like if you have this type of problem, uh, which is the best one we would suggest to use. That's uh, something we plan to do. Perfect. 
I also have, uh, I, I don't know if somebody else has another question. Uh, I have one for uh, for the R RKPM methods. Uh, so, yeah. question is uh, in a nutshell, very very simply, how, how is this method similar to SPH, smooth particle hydrodynamics, and the material point method? And how is different? Why would you go with this method? Um, so so. so so first of all, um, RKPM is a public domain, um, so we can um, we easy to use it. So, so that's the uh, main reason. Um, also, um, for material point method, um, it, it uses a background mesh, and uh, um, the use of linear shape function um, can cause numerical errors due to uh, the material points cross cell. So it's called. Um, uh, cell closing, so you can cause numerical error. So that's that's the uh, uh, material point method. Um, so actually, the RKPM method, uh, reproducing kernel method, you um, will you will develop a pH um, um, smooth particle hydrodynamics, uh, but it's improved the accuracy and the stability of the SPH. Um, so. Um, so overall, uh, RKPM, um, uh, by, by, uh, is improve the accuracy and the stability of SPH by adding, uh, uh, um, uh, a kernel, by adding a kernel to impose, uh, reproducing conditions. So, so overall, I would say, um, RKPM, um, is, a um, magnificent framework. And, uh, um, but like I said, the main reason we choose RKPM, um, is a public domain, so so um, that that's uh, um, very easy to use, and uh, yeah, yeah. And can you uh, and uh, well, you know that now in NPM that you can also use spline shape functions or not. Right. So you can overcome that. But you know, I know Professor Chen. <laughs> And I know the quality of his work, so I, I don't uh, I don't mess with Professor Chen. <laughs> he's he's really good in in, in and he is a big supporter of this um, this method. Now tell me something about the performance. Uh, how is the performance that you are finding? And um, you know, let me let me start telling you that the performance of SPH and MPM is terrible. <laughs> okay, and uh, so you, you, I, I give you, I give you that. So these these methods are difficult, and they right. don't behave as good as uh, fine Dalen. What is your what is your experience? Um, I mean, I mean, um, uh, like I said, Professor Chen developed this framework for um, twenty years, more than twenty years, and uh, um, the RKPM two D is just public domain, so. Um, they, they they provide some um, uh, attractive features there, but uh, um, from the past work of Professor J. S. Chen, um, they use the uh, the RKPM uh, method to a lot of engineering problems. So I think I think it, it, um, the performance is excellent um, uh, in uh, impact problem and uh, uh, geotechnical engineering problems. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, and uh, I have I have a, a couple of uh, other questions uh, for uh, Kian, uh, or maybe Ahmed, if you have any questions, please. Uh, I don't want to be the only the only one. <laughs> so, uh, but Kian, um, I, I I I was looking at your. Um, why did you choose the walk when model? Oh, um, so at first, because, um, so for, for the near field, because I think it need to like represent the nonlinearity and the smooth curve transition from the initial elastic to the, 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 the final, <clears throat> to the final state when the ultimate resistance is reached. And also uh, it need to like um, model the hysteresis loop. So that, that's when I think of the, the, the Bachmann model. And then um, you were comparing with uh, analysis that you did with LS Dynac, that's correct? Uh, yes. Why, I have a couple of questions on that. Well, first is why didn't you use OpenSys for that? 
if you had the, also the, the model implemented in open why why did you, why did you go to LS Diner? Yeah, so uh, it's really like back to the day. I first came to US for my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> I started using the LS Diner and yeah, I, I just like use OpenSea like one one and a year ago, like not that like, long. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, because you had to use more you had to use more Coulomb there, no? Uh, so they, they have. Uh, uh, actually, we, we have another option. Maybe we can use the hysteresis uh, material uh, when, when we can simulate the, the, the shear modulus depends on, on, on the shear strain. Uh, okay. It's very like, important for, for the cyclic loading, but like, I, I haven't like uh, done that yet. So first well, because it, particularly when you have the work, the uh, work uh, model and you, wait, you can use open seas and uh, and use maybe Ahmed's model, either pressure independent multi yield or any other model, and you can capture that very well. And maybe uh, so. Uh, and my second question: Why do you use so many PML elements? You have a, a very large region of PMLs. Uh, why? Why is, you only, you only need one or two layers? Why so many? <clears throat> so um, so usually. Um, um, just a, li a little bit is good, but um, in uh, standard they recommend like eight to ten elements. But I checked with that case, and still there's a little bit of like uh, reflection. So I decided just to extend this. <clears throat> to make it, it very take much time, but like yeah, just on the safe side. <laughs> yeah, and you know, Open Seas has also PML, eh? So... Oh, uh, I I I read the manual, but like there's nothing there there. <laughs> No, there is nothing there in the manual. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> I know, I know, I know I that. But it's, to, like, no, but it's there. It's there, and uh, we implemented them, um, an element that was suggested by um, by Ertugrulta Zero Glue from UCLA. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So I, I see here the farcine is in the in the in the in. The, Farsin, do you have questions about modeling? Oh, he left. Oh no, that's oh, that's Farsin. Listening. You Listen. guys <laughs> way above my head. My models are much simpler. Um, well, in the previous session, you had questions. And you said that you were looking forward to, to our questions. Yes, but um, you guys are, well, I can ask you the question that I wanted to ask and I decided to take it to an offline session. So I'm gonna ask you this question. So I listened to your talk beautiful work on the piles. Okay. My question is, how much is the impact of adding that level of sophistication to the models compared to the benefit that we get on the superstructure response uh, in, let's say, major simulations? We are moving towards simulating a network. And uh, if we want to add all of these sophisticated models on top of the things that we do, it's going to take a long time to run. We cannot do all of these with the resources that we have in our hands. Everything is going to end up being done at NERI or other supercomputers, which having access would be a bit tough to do. So you're talking about modeling the whole bridge, for example, the whole bridge, the whole bridge. 20, 20, 20 spans, 20 spans. And uh, how, how do you model that? The model. How, how do you model right now the foundation? We put springs. It's like the foundation is reduced to um, rotational and translational springs. Now we can make those uh, springs a little bit more sophisticated, but they are definitely not to the level that your work is uh, showing. But maybe Gian's models would be good for that. <laughs> Gian's model would be perfect for that. Yeah, yeah simply if I the um model yeah yeah and uh, but but you are right you are right oh, and he left and it seems like and, he, and also oh, no, he's, he's here he's here first is here yeah but but you are right and then um, but suppose that you are trying to model a bridge abutment and you want to know the forces that because of lateral spreading and then uh, you want to model maybe as much of the, the bridge maybe not all the bridge but as much as the bridge and try to understand for that, these type of elements would uh, would help. If you have a three kilometers bridge, and and you are uh, depends on your interest, you may need to go to a simplified model. But the more you can add to the uh, 
into the analysis that doesn't destroy your performance completely, meaning that you cannot run it, I think the better. And uh, in this, in this, you have to go parallel. And maybe Boris, you have some some wisdom note on how to go to parallel, how to go to parallel, what to do. <laughs> um, Pedro, um, one, I want to make sure that I come out clear. I'm not saying that the um, sophisticated elements do not have any room or why we are doing it. I think definitely that's the place that we need to move forward. But there is a practical aspect to this. Yes. And there is a place that we need to see where we have to dedicate the resources and use sophisticated elements and where we can live with reduced models. Then these reduced models can be the formal model that Jan was talking about or places that they just one spring will do the work. Identifying where to do what is important. Yeah, I agree. A voice here. I mean, so uh, actually, it's interesting. So, so this is actually the you know this is the you know they used to say a million dollar question. A million dollars is not much. Well, it is, but uh, this is the main question of of uh, model sophistication. How how do you know if your model is good enough? Well, you have to be able to go to one or two level higher sophistication model to uh, and then you see the differences in response and then you decide as an engineer if your model is good enough for the purpose it's it's being made for but you have to be able to go to one or two level higher sophistication model to see what dif what difference does your simplification what difference will your uh, uh, essentially uh, epistemic uncertainty introduce uh, in model response i agree um, you need to be able to have a point of comparison that you can measure how much this uh, relaxation in your modeling would cost you. Yes. So, yeah. for example, for a bridge, you know, if you if you assume if you assume simple linear springs at the bottom of the bridge, you might get good results. But then, when, as, as the shaking goes up, as as you get beyond design earthquakes, those linear springs or even nonlinear springs might not give you good enough results, and you might you might actually be missing completely some different mechanics, some different physics that you will not be able to discover if you use those simplified models. So, so these extrapolations can be dangerous, but you have to be able to go to higher level sophistication model, one or two level higher sophistication, just to get a good feeling about your model performance and how far can you push the model. That's, that's the whole point. Yeah, I agree. So um, we are, Oh, oh, we are exactly at, at the time, at the time of the end of this uh, session.